Hello everyone, this is Ryan Crodel at Valencell. Uh, thanks for joining us here today for what's sure to be a, a very interesting webinar on uh, testing biometric wearables. I have Dr. Chris Eschbach here with me and uh, we will uh, hand it over to Dr. Eschbach in just a moment, but I wanted to go through some, uh, some quick housekeeping items before we, uh, before we get going here. A couple of quick things. Um, as far as um, the Q&A during the presentation goes, uh, we've got some time set aside at the end for Q&A, but feel free to submit your questions through the webinar interface, um, and we will take those questions as we go along here um, uh, throughout the webinar. And so uh, I'll jump in whenever we, we have questions come in uh, associated with the relevant content at the time. And um, so we will um, we'll do that as we go and then also at the end. Um, a couple of other housekeeping items. One, this is being recorded, so we will send out a link to, um, to that recording when it is ready so you can share that with any of your colleagues or anyone else you think might be interested in this who may not have been able to make it today. And uh, similarly, we will also, a question we always get is, uh, will the slides be made available? And yes, the, the slides will be uh, sent out as well along with the, the recording link. So, um, so with that, um, submit your questions through the, the Q&A interface in the webinar. And um, let's go ahead and get started. I'll, I'll quickly introduce Dr. Chris Eschbach, who has been with Valencell for many years now and runs our biometrics testing lab. Uh, for, for those of you that don't know, uh, uh, I'll do a quick intro of Valencell. We make the, the biometric sensor systems that go into wearable devices of all kinds, whether that's smartwatches, fitness bands, earbuds, a variety of other form factors. We make the, the biometric sensor systems that measure heart rate and other, uh, other biometrics in those wearable devices. And, uh, we uh, help our customers who are the, the makers of those devices integrate that technology into those devices. And a, a key part of that integration and product development process is the testing of those devices in the, the early prototype phase on up through to production. And so that's part of what we do in the, the biometrics testing lab. We'll go into a lot more depth onto what Chris and his team do. Um, so without further ado, I'll, I'll hand over to Chris. Thanks, Ryan. Hey, everyone. It's Chris. Um, I'm excited to go through what we do here at, at Valencell headquarters and in, in my laboratory. Uh, kind of go through uh, Go through what we're going to uh, cover today and outline the, just, what we're. Oh, we lost it. The, stopped sharing. We can reshare. Bear with us for a moment. Minor technical difficulty here. We'll, we'll get the slides back up. Uh, here we go. And then. Well, an outline of what I, I want to cover today is, is really a describe what we do on a week-to-week -week basis in the laboratory. Uh, we, we've, are, are, we work very closely with our partners, all of the partners uh, that deal with balance as, as Ryan described, and I think it's surprising to some of our partners how closely we work, how much integration the laboratory has uh, with their devices from the very early thoughts of prototypes through manufacturing, and then how the laboratory interacts with the entire company of Valencell. It is really the central hub, both uh, literally and figuratively in our office, uh, where the interactions take place of, from, from all aspects, uh, engineering, sales, R&D, all comes through the lab, and my team is responsible for kind of juggling all of those, uh, those requests. So we'll overview the, the laboratory. Uh, what my team consists of. We'll go through the, the lab workflow and what we're really charged with doing here at Valencell. Outline the data collection process and talk about some areas for consideration. And then, and then finally, uh, finish off with how we do some data analysis 
how we do some of our reporting, uh, and along the way, as Ryan talked about, answer your questions. So feel free on the uh, web interface to, uh, to enter those questions, and Ryan will bring, the, bring them up as we go. So we'll start off with an overview of the lab uh, and the team and, and our workflow. We've, uh, we are a team of primarily exercise physiologists, although we have some biomedical engineering uh, individuals. We have uh, biology and nutrition individuals in the lab right now. And, uh, but the foundation is exercise science uh, in, inside the lab, and that's because my background is exercise science uh, and, and athletics and that sort of thing. My uh, background, I was a, a college professor for 11 years, and I started a laboratory in 2001 with a primary objective to do physiological monitoring of, a, of athletes. And it wasn't just elite athletes, it was everyday athletes up to elite athletes. And it's a continuum. I think everyday athletes and general health and fitness individuals need the same things as the elite athletes do. So I started a lab in 2001 and, uh, and, and performed assessments. And that lab grew uh, over those 10 or 11 years, and, and then I, we started working uh, at, with the early phases of balance on early prototype when we f first had the idea of integrating sensors into wearable devices and trying to make sensors seamless and, and providing actionable feedback. And that, that relationship grew, and, uh, and then we, uh, I built the lab out here at Valence Cell, and, and that's continued to grow over the last kind of seven or eight years to, the, to where we're at now. We work with a, a pool of around 100 volunteers, and there are people that kind of come in and out of that pool at any time. All of our volunteers, uh, we do, for their participation coming into the office, we do uh, compensate them. Generally, we give them uh, gift cards, about $20 an hour in gift cards uh, when they're here with us. We, our, our population, and we'll talk about this a little more later, but our requirements for being part of our participant pool is, is uh, pretty, it's a wide participant pool. We do require that someone's 18 years of age and older, just mainly uh, working with minors makes it more complicated, that they have no uh, restrictions on being able to jog at least lightly for about three and a half minutes. Beyond that, there, there really isn't anything. Um, and we will work with that pool and like I said, it kind of comes in and out. Wide variety of fitness levels, ages, uh, skin tones, which we'll talk about as important later on. We, again, uh, testing protocols, we'll, we'll separate that section out as well, but specific protocols uh, for needed use cases. And then the facility itself has the ability to do just about anything. We can, we can uh, do lifestyle activities, daily, daily activities of daily living, running, cycling, we can go swimming, uh, gym style activities. On a year to year basis, you see on, on the screen that we do conduct over 24,000 different device tests and, and the lab is busy, uh, busy week to week. And, and we always think it's going, it, our testing is going to slow down, but the combination of partnership testing, R&D, uh, questions that we're asking ourselves keeps the lab busy uh, all the time. Lots of uh, biometric data points, as you can imagine, and then the, the total number of hours per year that we measure testing, and you'll see how that breaks out shortly. Um, these are there's some pictures I actually took this morning of the lab and some of our, our setup. Uh, I'll, I'll go through these pictures, but uh, we have, you know, all sorts of equipment uh, in the laboratory. Our primary testing is, is on treadmills, and I'll explain why that is in a little bit, even if we're doing an a activity of daily living wearable or um, something along those lines, it still goes through treadmill testing to see how robust the, the wearable is. So in, in our laboratory, tre we have three treadmills. Um, we have a central location where the core of my team sits, including myself, every day uh, and, and communicate and share data. We have the ability to do kind of strength activities and, and high intensity strength if we need to do pull-ups or anything that we can, we can do those activities. We have the rowers and, and cyclo ergometers. And then this lower center picture outside of the lab is an area that we have set up to collect resting data. We may be monitoring uh, heart rate variability. We may be monitoring day-to-day -day, uh, stress patterns, uh, 
questionnaires and that sort of thing. And this morning, and, and we monitor blood pressure on individuals. And this morning, we were doing a project uh, monitoring blood pressure, and you see uh, individuals sitting there for those trials. The laboratory uh, operations on a week on a weekly basis. We are performing uh, for a uh, right at 40 exercise sessions per week. Those exercise sessions are one hour in duration. <clears throat> Individuals come in, uh, are with us for that that hour, and go through specific protocols that we have uh, on the schedule relative to our priority list for testing. In addition to those 40 exercise sessions per week that are one hour in duration, uh, we have uh, ex other exercise sessions that are validation of commercial uh, products and training programs. So we have 20 sessions a week uh, that se set aside for these exercise sessions, validation and training. And what happens in that situation is that we take commercially available devices with valence cell tech in them, uh, and also commercially available devices without valence cell tech in, tech in them, and perform validation on them uh, in various protocols, and uh, report back to our team, uh, to the company, kind of the state of uh, the market, where, where everything is, how are we performing out in uh, once it's commercialized, and how are other uh, wearable devices performing. And then as and we do some of that as, uh, as our R&D in terms of new metrics and that sort of thing. We also conduct training programs. So most of the uh, sessions that I've talked about uh, so far are acute uh, testing. So a participant comes in, we are interested in the data during that one hour session. And it's not one hour of total exercise, as I'll describe later, multiple sessions within the hour. But we do conduct training programs on small groups of individuals. We take uh, groups of individuals, train them from anywhere from six to 18 weeks in duration. And looking at this longitudinal change in their fitness and their health status as time goes on. So that, that is um, to see how the sensors per, uh, perform over time. That's one. The other part of it is kind of thought leadership uh, in terms of we, we review literature, uh, talk about training programs, implement training programs, that sort of thing. We want to see the, the physiological response to those programs over time and how the biometrics change, and that's part of these other exercise sessions. In addition to that, we have 30 uh, trials per week or sessions per week where we're collecting resting data or data that's at rest over, long, uh, again, longitudinally. So that may mean uh, blood pressure data, and we're in a big uh, collection of blood pressure at this time. And um, then we, we also do this longitudinal. So we may, get, we may have questionnaires and feedback on stress and that sort of thing, collect data as it goes there. The laboratory staff consists of uh, these roles. The director, that's myself, overviewing and managing all of the uh, projects and individuals and team that interacts with the lab. We have an operations lead. That operations lead is responsible for uh, scheduling and prioritization of tests. We have a data lead that's responsible for uh, making sure the data is handled properly, the correct algorithms are run, a reports lead that uh, continually organizes this data and feeds back to the company appropriate information. And then we have several what I call trial specialists that are responsible for overseeing and collecting the data day to day and week to week. The, the general workflow of the laboratory uh, is outlined here. We, uh, of course, are doing lots of scheduling, as you can imagine, with collecting so much data. Uh, with people scheduling and canceling and changing their times and making sure we're getting um, a, a wide variety of people in. We, uh, a big part of our day every day is prioritization of what is in test, what needs to be test and what is being requested. Spend a lot of time on experimental designs. Everything that comes into the, lo into the lab uh, is a, an experiment in our, in our minds, so we want to design those properly, have proper controls for those experiments. And then uh, as devices come in and these experimental requests are uh, made, we have a pretty rigorous intake process that even on any device that comes into the lab, we document everything about that device, whether it's a device under development here at Valencell or some other device, 
all things are documented about that. Physical labels are made on those devices. You can imagine that if you have a few commercial devices that you've purchased and they're giving off Bluetooth low energy heart rate and you have a whole lot of other devices that are giving off Bluetooth signals uh, that it's, we need to keep those straight, make sure that we know what's being connected to what sort of collection devices. And so that's, a, that's actually a pretty uh, difficult thing to do when you're working with so many sensors. And then of course the reporting of it all and giving that out in, in an easy, easily, uh, understand, easy to understand way. The, the, um, the, the way the lab operates really is this cyclical pattern where devices come in. My lab itself reviews the design of all devices. So we, we have uh, regular meetings each week to review designs. That's separate from any mechanical engineers or electrical engineers reviewing the designs. And I think that's a really important aspect to remember as it relates to this best practices of biometric wearables. My lab team sees so many unique individuals, they see so much unique data that they can give feedback about a biometric wearable, how it's placed on the body. Something as simple as a, oh, that, that, the band of that smartwatch should be, work no problem. A, a mechanical engineer may, may think that, yes, I've got this pretty optimized. They give it to my lab and the lab brings it in. They observe this thing, this device being uh, placed by the individual, the participant. They understand that uh, certain bands are more and less comfortable, and we, and we go and give feedback to the team. So it's, it's really important that, that the people that have their hands in testing these biometric wearables are also part of the teams giving the feedback to the people designing the project product, and that never ends. That's a continual process. It's gone on for the eight years, eight years or more that I've been involved here, and it continues every day. So we'll talk about data collection process and then some areas for consideration. We'll talk about a little bit about these participants, go into data collection, and, then, and some, some other highlights. So I've, I've mentioned this before, but the participants really, there are no huge requirements for the participants. Uh, I, they need to be 18 or older, and I'm happy for them to be as old as they need to be. The, some of the uh, exercise organizations have some increased risk for older individuals, but age itself is not a risk for exercise. We want uh, all sorts of people um, and, and our upper age limit here, we have a few, quite a few participants in their 60s, a couple in their 70s, and of course then we modify exercise and protocols based on what their abilities are. Uh, they, need to, they need to be uh, somewhat healthy. They can't have a high, uh, high number of risk factors. We are exercising these individuals. If they do have a high number of risk factors, they can go into some of our other trials, some of our resting trials. But we, do, we are conscious about uh, their risk. And then, of course, their availability. We do have set hours in the lab. They can't just show up to the lab and, and, and uh, do the assessments. And we do ask that they come back on at least a semi-regular basis, maybe at least once a month. We want them to be uh, familiar and efficient coming into the lab so we can collect as much data as possible. Wide, wide variety of participant characteristics. We collect uh, all sorts of things about the participants, uh, their age, their weight, their skin tone, uh, anatomical measures, which I'll talk about in a second. We collect several, we collect a, an extensive health history on the participant. Beyond that, we ask them to fill out and uh, we have them sign an informed consent so they understand what they're getting into. We actually have all of our participants sign a non-disclosure agreement and a media release. And we've learned over time that we need to just be proactive on this, that we have individuals coming in. All uh, media that can come in, our partners are here. We have multiple partner products. All partner products are code named. So most participants don't know what they are, but they, uh, if they happen to uh, start to understand what they are, they, we have an NDA and they understand to not spread any uh, details about the products that we have in test. They all get a laboratory introduction and then anatomical measures and we take pictures and not of their, uh, their face necessarily, but of their ear and their wrist and their arm. We, and I'll show you in a second that we take uh, measures of most of those things as well. Our database actually collects pictures uh, and we can tag those pictures. Our goal on all, all prototype testing is to test 20, 20 different participants 
using our eight-minute dynamic treadmill test, and we'll detail that as, as time goes on here in a bit on the, uh, the slide deck. Uh, on the anatomical measures, documentation, and pictures of our participants, this is an example of that. Participants come in. We actually take a mold of their ear. So valence cell sensor technology goes in earbuds. Uh, it's one of our favorite places to have sensors in, one, because we think it's one of the most accurate places. Uh, with a secure fitting earbud, you get great biometrics. But everyone's ear is like a is like a fingerprint. They're all unique and we take a mold of the ears so we can study their ear if we need to when they're not here. We take pictures of their ears and we also take actual measurements of their ears. You can see two of our primary measures here we call Concha Y and Concha X. Uh, and that uh, feeds back into our design teams, our, our engineers to help optimize the fit, uh, optimize the comfort while uh, optimizing the security. And it's not just security for our sensors, it's security for individuals that might be wearing something all day or exercising uh, in an extreme environment and the earbud uh, will stay in. And we can provide that to our partners as, uh, as design recommendations for a product that they're, uh, they're designing. Then on the arm, you can see that we take measures of the, the participant's wrist we do that at very specific locations on the wrist. We also have measurements for other locations on the body that uh, our partners might want to pl take uh, place sensors. But from the wrist standpoint, um, one of the most important things about wrist-worn wearables is that we want to avoid, for the most part, the, ulna, the bone at the wrist, the ulnar bone at the wrist, the little knobby bone on the outside of your, uh, your wrist because the sensor can ride or rock on that. So we recommend, of course, wearing it a little higher when you're going to uh, be looking at uh, especially optical biometrics uh, for that optimization of the signal. And, and we take measurements around that, that point uh, for our participants. Skin tone is important. It's not as important as I think a lot of people think so out in the world, but we do document the skin tone with the Fitzpatrick uh, skin type. We ask our participants to score themselves, and if this changes as the, as the seasons progress, and they may have more uh, tan skin, then we will re-rate them, and our database uh, keeps track of all of this. I'll say um, what I mentioned before is that skin tone is not as important as uh, people think that it is. It is important. Of course, darker skin absorbs more light than lighter skin when we're talking about optical sensors, which is what Valence Cell specializes in. But I can promise that from experience, it's not just skin tone. We have uh, low Fitzpatrick skin type individuals that are higher absorbers of light. And we have high Fitzpatrick skin type individuals that, are not, that don't absorb light like you would think they are. There's more factors. There may be connective tissue. Uh, there may be other skin structure, uh, anatomy type things happening under the skin that may just be genetic. There are um, individuals that just because of their skin type doesn't make them a difficult individual. Some of them to take biometrics from. Some are, some aren't. There are other factors in that. And we'll talk some, about some of those as we go on. We uh, look at comfort and security of our wearables as they go through the lab, and we've come up with some scales. This is a simple scale, five-point scale, that we have individuals rate, rate the, scent, the biometric wearable. We might primarily try to focus on comfort and security, and that comfort and security is specific to, um, you know, the use case. So you may be wearing it all day, or you may be wearing it in an exercise session, and we, we ask our participants for that, and it is specific to the device. We have it for earbuds, we have it for armbands, uh, and that sort of thing. Data collection. Uh, our metrics collection, ideally we're collecting raw data. Uh, in our metrics, though, we're collecting heart rate, we're collecting heart rate intervals, RRI, uh, heart, for heart rate variability. Of course, steps, blood pressure, and then other measures. My, the next bullet below this, calories, VO2, speed, and distance, are estimates based on metrics that we are measuring more directly. So in our metrics collection, we may be interested in all of those, but they're coming, we've got to understand the source and then we've got to very importantly understand our baseline devices. What are we comparing these metrics to? So we have a 
you know, a chest strap heart rate monitor, an electrocardiogram. We take videos when we're measuring steps, and that's the best practice for a step measurement is to take a video and manually count that. That takes a lot of time, a lot of effort to do that the, the right way. And then for blood pressure, of course, uh, manual and automatic blood pressure measurements. We'd like to do arterial blood pressure on occasion. Of course, that's difficult to do. On uh, some of the, the calories and the oxygen consumption and that sort of thing, we use indirect calorimetry. And you can see a picture in the upper right here of us using indirect calorimetry, collecting respiratory gases uh, to do that uh, uh, measurement. We have measured courses that we've manually measured There's the distance of these courses, and then, of course, calibrated treadmills. We'll talk more about equipment as time goes on. I'll say one thing about best practices as it, as it relates to heart rate. Everyone um, believes that electrocardiograms is the gold standard for measuring heart rate. It's certainly the gold standard for measuring electrocardiogram, uh, but there are a majority of electrocardiograms were not set up to uh, go through exercise protocols where the individual is sweaty, where the exercise session is changing, where they're moving a lot, and you end up with a lot of noise on those electrocardiogram systems. And there may be a few out there that are, are really, really good. Uh, I have yet to sh have anyone prove to me that um, any of them are bomb-proof, including, uh, you know, taking all the effort to make it happen, shave the chest, abrade the chest, put the electrodes on, secure the electrodes with extra glue, secure the electrodes with a wrap around the torso or special shirts. There, it, there's always times when you're going to have bad data coming from uh, baseline devices when you're dealing with humans. Uh, if we, it, it, my opinion is if we see research out there that has Showing that, showing that they've used an electrocardiogram as the gold standard and do not report any errors on that electrocardiogram, they've actually collected more data than what they're showing. They've probably said, you know, those are, that's outlier data. We're, we'll, we'll recollect that data. But I think it's important for us in industry to re, not only, uh, whether we're using an electrocardiogram or a chest strap, to report the data Use, of course, the baseline data needs to be good data, but report how much data that we're not using because it may not work properly. Because of the, uh, the inability of a lot of ECG and the, the, such the great prep that an electrocardiogram takes, we use the chest strap heart rate monitor. Chest strap heart rate monitor properly maintained, meaning changing the batteries off and keeping them clean, uh, setting them up with electrode gel is a great uh, reference for heart rate. Uh, and and we'll, we'll talk about this more in just a second in terms of its, it, the context of these, uh, the, the, especially chest strap heart rate monitor. What are some of my laboratory tools uh, for our best practices? We need a wide range of participants, and we've already talked about that. We need an experienced staff. That's really, really important. I'll put my lab team up against anybody for collecting data. Uh, we've been to research-grade research uh, institutions, and we've actually had to take part of my team there to train these individuals on things as simple as connecting multiple Bluetooth devices to multiple smartphones. Uh, we're talking about experienced research, big grant institutions that don't have the experience with this. So getting hands-on experience with, with all sorts of devices is really important, and having a team that can troubleshoot that. Databases and data experts that can overcome these data collection and, and interface challenges. When we're, when we're collecting devices from commercial, when we're collecting data from commercial devices, the, the type, the, the format that this de these metrics come off of these devices is widely varied. How do we handle that data? How do we align that data? How do we take multiple um, inputs into one input, and we need the, uh, you know, databases to be able to handle that, and then data exports to overcome those, uh, those hurdles as we do it. My staff is part of that expert team, but we also have data science here at Valencell that helps us with when we're really trying to add on to our database. Data collectors. How do you collect your data? In the most simplified format, you're taking Bluetooth low energy heart rate and you're putting it into a, a pretty simple app that you might have gotten uh, commercially. Wahoo Fitness is a, is a simple app. It's easy to export. It's pretty straightforward. It's one that we suggest and, and it is one of our go-tos as we need it. 
We've actually uh, built out our own application that allows for multiple inputs at one time so we can collect just about as many Bluetooth low energy sensors as we'd like, whether that's heart rate, step rate, uh, cycling cadence, all those sorts of things into one single application. We can collect, you know, five Bluetooth low energy heart rate devices into one that may be on a single individual. And uh, we built out that application. That's very helpful. Beyond that, if we're, just, if we're going best practices and, you, and you're keeping it simple, uh, it's buy multiple uh, smartphones or, you know, uh, smartphones, put Wahoo Fitness or something like that on it, make sure you're synchronizing that start time, everything's connected, and you're going to have to deal with these individual files of, as they come off with it. We, of course, then have our own data collectors that uh, collect our raw data. Exercise equipment. There's nothing more valuable than a treadmill that can run itself with some of these uh, protocols. We actually have treadmills, and we're using treadmills right now that use what is uh, iFit, and um, sometimes it, they're, uh, they're not quite the high, high-end commercial-grade treadmills, but the most important thing about them is we can program our own protocols. There is no human error in changing the speed, changing the grade uh, as we go through our sections of our protocols. So that, that is one of the, our most important pieces of equipment, that we have treadmills that are programmable uh, and have our, pro our protocols sent. Uh, we actually send them wirelessly. Our, our bikes, our strength equipment, we have lifestyle tests that mimic these activities of daily living. All of that equipment is there. And uh, reference devices, that you have plenty of reference devices. Uh, we, we work through, you know, you can, you can uh, understand the number of, say, chest straps that we go through every day in our laboratory. So having lots of that and backup uh, data collectors. You can see in the upper right-hand picture here, I have an a Android smartphone, and the application actually that I have up on that smartphone is something called Impetus, which is an interval timer. We use that pretty widely. We program our, uh, when we're not using treadmill protocols and we're using lifestyle activities, we program those uh, protocols into Impetus, and uh, it actually beeps and tells the participant uh, visually what stage that they're in and we can look at it and guide the participant. You can see our puzzle there. We use puzzles as part of our lifestyle protocol for people to work with their hands and mimic uh, office work or factory work. Uh, and then the data collection devices I've already talked about, kind of smartphones, of course cameras that we can use the smartphones for, uh, different programs. I've mentioned impetus and then computers to deal with all of this uh, and specialized programs that we've come up with. And back early in Valencel uh, time, we relied on a lot of manual inputs and outputs. Excel was our friend. We are, my lab crew has been with me for a while, and they are, you know, experts at dealing with this data and, and dealing with those uh, things just even on a manual level. We've gone much beyond that with our databases. Uh, here is one more thing about the reference devices. Over time, individuals, uh, uh, partners of ours and other individuals that have contacted us and asked about performance of biometric wearables uh, says, well, I, I want 100% accurate accuracy. Well, for one, we're dealing with humans. Let's be sensible about this. 100% accuracy of just about anything we're measuring on a human uh, is not possible. We're, we're dealing with a wide range of humans. We're dealing with physiological changes, uh, all sorts of things that can complicate this. So one of the things that we wanted to do is, how can we baseline this? We have done uh, several studies on this now, and this is three representative data sets of three um, studies using at least 20 people, most time we've used more than 20, doing, having two chest straps on the exact same individual, of course, randomizing the, the placement on the chest, they're both in a, in a, still in a good position on the chest. They're not bumping into each other. Two chest straps on each other. How accurate are the chest straps when compared to each other? And you can see that what this uh, frequency distribution shows is what percentage of the data is it within plus or minus 5% of the other device, the other chest strap. In this case, there's no real gold standard. They're both chest straps. But you can see that 93%. 92 and 96% of the data were within plus or minus 5%. And this is in a dynamically changing treadmill protocol. Uh, it gives context. 
So you want to give context to those reference devices uh, when we're measuring calories. It's the same thing when we're doing indirect calorimetry. We want to know uh, what the, the error within the, the, uh, our reference devices are. In our data collection pro process, match your protocols to your intended use case. I had mentioned that we go through our treadmill test. Everything goes through our treadmill test. We want our, we want our own baseline for that. Everything goes through our treadmill test, but we have specific protocols for use cases. We have our participant place the devices on individuals, but we will then take doc we will document what they do, and then we will then give some correction if needed and document that correction and feedback. In our metrics collection, I'm going to focus on heart rate as that's the foundationally, that's what Valencell, where we came from. We, of course, do accelerometry type things as well. But um, in heart rate, ideally, we're collecting raw data. If we're not collecting raw data, I want Bluetooth low energy heart rate, just standard Bluetooth profile heart rate. It makes it easy. What starts to make it difficult is testing devices that have what I'll call proprietary heart rate output. Maybe the heart rate, is, it has no ability to transmit heart rate, or, and the heart rate's just housed within the device, can I offload the heart rate? Can I get a CSV file from that device? It's really important to be able to access that information, and this is commercially as well. I think this information should be available to the consumer. It's not in many devices, but it should be available to the consumer. If we can't get the, the, the worst possible scenario for us, is that we will actually read the heart rate off of the screen of the device, and we have methods so we're not interrupting the exercise. We will read the heart rate off of the screen of the device during the exercise session and manually enter that heart rate on, on time intervals, say, every five seconds, so we can understand the performance. Of course, that, we do not want to do that, but we do it um, when when the heart rate is very inaccessible, which again, I think is wrong for anyone to, designing a wearable to make their heart rate uh, completely uh, uh, unaccessible to the participant. When we're giving, when we're uh, analyzing our data, our ideal situation is, is post-processed to one second intervals uh, and, uh, and compare the data at one second interval. If we can't do that, then we'll do longer intervals, but it's not our ideal situation. In terms of protocols, this is our foundational protocol. What you see on the right-hand side, that brown line, that's the step rate, just an example of one of our participants going through our eight-minute protocol. Uh, they're, they're standing at the beginning of it with some, they moved, uh, which is a mistake on their part, but there was some movement that shouldn't have happened. And then there's walking here uh, in the first section a three minute and 15 second running segment, then they'll walk again, they'll run again, walk at the end and stand at the very end. The reasons for this is we want dynamically changing heart rate, we want dynamically changing step rate, we want the movement to be different as the protocol goes. This protocol is really probably one of the most difficult things for, for uh, biometrics wearables. I'm not, not talking just about optically, biometric wearables, but all sorts of uh, wearables in terms of the heart rate's changing, the heart rate's going down, the heart rate's staying in steady state during the, the three-minute section of the protocol. And you can see our general speeds of, the, of our protocol here uh, during our test. We have uh, lots of other protocols. Uh, those protocols, if you're designing your own protocols, I think should be pretty darn specific, especially if you're evaluating your wearable. Uh, whether, and in turn, when I mean by specific, if you're doing strength exercises, don't just say do three sets of 10. Uh, that, that's okay if you're doing real world kind of data collection, but if you're really trying to do analysis, you need defined intervals in that, okay, we're going to do this strength session, this strength exercise for this much time, and then we're going to trans, trans, refer uh, to another exercise and know what those exercises are. So when you're looking at your data, you know what segments you're looking at. We have uh, specific pro, uh, protocols, uh, very specific that go through all this testing. Sunlight testing's up there at the top. I uh, haven't really mentioned that, but uh, especially with optical sensors, sunlight's important. Uh, and we do baseline testing on a variety of days under different sunlight conditions uh, to make sure that, that, uh, that everything is working outside, uh, again, for the, specifically for the optical case. Lots of protocols. We have a, a pool that we have access to just down the road from our headquarters. 
And, um, and then moving beyond that, I wanted to mention one, give a plug for the Consumer Technology Association. I'm the co-chair of the Health and Fitness Tech Standards Committee. Uh, we have created and are creating standards. There's a couple that are out there already. There's a standard for step counting. It's a pretty straightforward step counting standard, but it is the first standard really for step counting. It provides accuracy standards. It provides protocols. There's uh, definitions and characteristics for wearable sleep monitors. And then we're working on some other standards. Heart rate is a standard we're working on. Um, other uh, sleep tracking for consumer technology devices is a standard being worked on. And then stress monitoring technologies is a standard as well. All three of those are being worked on as we speak with, and would be out in, in, in the coming months. Um, highly involved, of course, with, uh, with all of them, but the heart rate uh, standard is, is uh, dear to my heart because of what we do here at Valencell and have done for, for many years. So what are some areas of consideration, some, some hurdles? Well, in optical sensors, optical noise. And that's why we do that eight-minute treadmill test. We want a variety of heart rates and step rates and movement patterns, that sort of thing that I've talked about. Skin tone we've talked about, which is important. Um, blood perfusion is important. If someone has a wrist-borne wearable and their hands are freezing cold then, and have very little blood flow to that uh, extremity, then optical sensors are going to have a difficult time picking up. How do we deal with that? What can we do to optimize that? How can we document that? How can we provide the consumer with some feedback on that? Uh, I'm going to go to the lower right and say crossover problems. Cro having heart rate moving up as the step rate is at a certain level. Say your running step rate is 160 steps per minute and your heart rate is going from 110 beats up to 170 beats per minute, your heart rate is going to cross through that step rate range at, say, 160 steps per minute. That's difficult for wearables, not just optical wearables. All wearables uh, uh, is, is difficult there. Does the wearable, can it stay on the heart rate without getting confused by the step rate? So that's something to consider in your protocols. And then, of course, sensor location. The wrist is not the best location on the body by far. Do we want it on the wrist? Certainly. I, I love wearing a smartwatch. I like to have my uh, biometrics when I'm exercising look down at my wrist. The ear is, is a much better location. It's more stable. The blood flow there uh, capillary-wise is better. Um, of course, then wearables in terms of uh, residing on the chest are good. They're pretty stable to the center of body. I think also location as it relates to accelerometry data, whether it's counting activity or steps is important. Uh, of, co of course, wearing it on the wrist is different than wearing it at the core of the body. One of the things I'll talk about in terms of things to consider also are just in terms of a team and testing biometric wearables, my team, as I said, review the sensors and, um, and we give lots of feedback to the engineers. I can promise that if you do not have lots and lots of hours sitting in front of humans, and I'm not just saying putting on yourself and running around in the parking lot behind your office. I'm talking about really working with individuals. Those people working with those individuals have insight that no one has ever thought of before in terms of what is the strap like to connect the watch that the, the person puts on. Just the clasp itself can cause problems in biometric wearables. The whole pattern on the wrist-worn device has, a, a, has an impact. How is that perceived by the individual? How does the excess band, how does it get put onto the watch and secured? That's troubling to an individual. They like some of them, they don't like some of them. So all those are considerations. <clears throat> Go through the uh, data analysis a little bit and then uh, may take some questions if there are any out there. Uh, the data analysis is pretty straightforward. We've talked a lot about it already, uh, and, and I'm, I'm, I can expect that you would understand most of it um, from our previous slides. But, we, but our thing here at Valencell is we, you really need to both subjectively measure these data sets and quantify these data sets. These baseline devices do not work all of the time, and this graph here on the right-hand side is, a, is a, an example of that. You see the dark brown line, that's their step rate. So you can see that this was this interval uh, session that we had going. Um, and the orange line is, a, is the device under test. It happens to be uh, a, a, a biometric uh, perform tech uh, valence cell device. And then the blue line is the chest strap heart rate monitor. 
And you can see anyone that understands kind of even physiology, we hope this isn't real because if it is real, someone's having some serious uh, electrical issues in their heart. But we're at, we have bad data here with the chest strap. It's not unusual. You start to learn to see it. But we need to place our eyes on that. We cannot just put this data into a machine and get data out of it. In this particular data set, the data wouldn't be ideally accurate. It's not a problem with the device under test. It's a problem with our reference device in this case. So we need to, we need to look at it. And in, at, here in my lab, we actually lie, put our eyes on every single data set that we collect. It takes a lot of time, but it's worth it. We subjectively score every single data set even before we quantify it. And I'll talk about how we subjectively score that in a bit. Um, but this it provides this confidence in your data. I have confidence in my, in my baseline data. Uh, and then it, and the way we subjectively score it is easily understood by our partners in these fast design cycles. We know in the industry we need to turn these things around, these prototypes, get them turned around. I don't want my, our partners to have to kind of start to understand some of the deeper statistics. It's easy enough to make a heat map and get them to understand this thing is accurate enough for what we're trying to do, or it's not, and we need to make some changes, and here are suggested changes. That erratic data is, is, as you can imagine, pretty straightforward. What I like to call jitter, that's what we see here. It just, it's not normal. I always joke, I say heart, heart rate doesn't make right hand turns. If it's making a right hand turn, then something's wrong. So heart rate doesn't just go straight up and straight to the right when you graph it out. Um, so, and then jitter, uh, like we're seeing in this graph, and then of course, heart rate outside of expected physiological ranges. Uh, all that, will are kind of grounds for us to just exclude that data. Although, like I said, you should report your exclusion of that data if you're uh, reporting on it. And I don't think that's actually done in the, the peer-reviewed published literature very often. Here's a, uh, an example of our uh, subjective scoring. These are our three main categories. We have a couple minor categories, but it's really pretty straightforward. We have excellent, good, and we have poor, a lost tracking or we have poor performance. And I'm going to show you what that, what that means more in a second. Excellent is everything's good. And, and in all, here at Valencell, our primary subjective scoring came out of looking at our raw data. So you, it's not ideal to just graph this uh, from BLE heart rate and make subjective scores. We do it with that plus our uh, raw data. That's our ideal situation for subjectively scoring. We will subjectively score off of graphs, but we know that it's less granular. So we have excellent, perfect, great tracking for the whole thing. Uh, good, our signal may not be as strong as we'd like it to be. Maybe there was a little bit of uh, tracking that we don't like, but a consumer would still be okay with it, and we can still do uh, what we want with it in terms of the use cases. And then the lost tracking where there are segments that uh, are lost for moderate to long durations, or it may be a complete catastrophe and the thing didn't track at all. You don't need 20 tests if the first five tests uh, all are complete catastrophes. We, we won't uh, move to 20 uh, complete failures very often. We do it, but uh, we'll, we'll kind of test the waters and move on with our experiments uh, of a goal of getting at least 20 different individuals with every uh, variant. And I, when I say variant, I'm talking about if we change the gel configuration of an earbud, the earbud mechanics didn't change other than what the gel that go, went on the earbud, we're going back and shooting for 20 additional participants. Subjectively scoring all of this, uh, when we subjectively score, you may say, well, what's the, what does it mean? I want it quantified. Well, this is how it uh, pans out. When we score our subjective scoring, excellent tests are generally about 90% of the data is within plus or minus 5%. The good is about 85% of the data within plus or minus 5%. And then poor, of course, is worse than that, or it's mistracking for longer periods. And we say greater than 10% for more than 40 seconds. Well, if I'm exercising for three hours, 40 seconds is not much time. But if it's short protocol, that seems to be a pretty big time. So it's still, there's some subjective. We have more rules than this when we try to put it into our database and have the machine do it. But we still do all the subjective uh, scoring. We do greater statistics, uh, uh, mean and standard deviation when, when appropriate. And I'll say when appropriate because you don't take a mean heart rate from an eight-minute treadmill test. And the only thing standard deviation is going to tell you is that I had vari variable heart rate during the test. Not that it, it's, it's not, um, in that case, standard deviation is not a good comparison statistic. 
but something like mean absolute percent error and the bias as a percent error is a comparison between two devices, a, a baseline and a device under test. We do the frequency distributions, and then we'll do bland Altman correlation as needed, and then accuracy, accuracy related to intensity. So how accurate is it low intensities and high intensities, and how is that defined? Some things to consider, and then we'll, I'll, I'll go through a couple examples, and we'll be ready for the uh, last five minutes of questions, some key questions. Baseline errors. When you're looking at your data, what are our baseline errors? This is a complete failure of the chest strap here in the lower uh, left-hand side where um, this chest strap data, uh, in this case, is off track and this orange line with the device under test uh, is, um, is, is, this is our eight minute test. So we know what the shape of the line should be in that. Uh, and, and the device, the blue line, is, is off base. Time for heart rate lock. Uh, this center graph, you can see here, we, we made a mistake and we had the person get going before we really, and, and started our official data collection before this device is time to lock onto the person's heart rate. They had a lower heart rate. And you can imagine, if you've ever used a, a chest strap or anything, there's time when you hit the start button before you actually hit go where you've got to find the heart rate. And that was a mistake, and this could affect your, your statistics. And then both data alignment and latency. If you happen to be collecting with two devices and don't hit the start button at the same time, don't do your stats without aligning your data. And if there's an inherent latency between one device and the other, um, you want to quantify that latency by lining up the devices and then understanding the statistics. Don't do your statistics on devices that are offset because of latency. Report the latency and then report the statistics with the latency removed. Uh, this is an example of a heat map that we have here that we give to our participant, our, our uh, partners. And you can just see it's color coded, provides date and time, and then um, and then statistics on the, the devices. The first box is what the performance was in all of the devices under test. And then what we do is remove the obvious failures and report the statistics when all devices are working properly. We do that for the chest straps. We report how many chest strap data uh, fail if that's our baseline device and then do our statistics. So this first, the middle table is where all chest strap data is working correctly. And then the second table to the right is where both devices are working correctly and all obvious failures are removed. And then we visualize the uh, plus or minus 5% with just some uh, bar graphs. We visualize this is our moderate and the lower intensity exercise on the left and what percentage of data is doing well, the orange bar is within plus or minus 5%. And then we've got our vigorous data here, 93% of the data of the vigorous data with, with, was within plus or minus 5%. We do our, uh, reg our uh, regression lines, our correlation, and then our bland Altman's to visualize. I think personally, I think these are slightly less important except to really see some of these outliers here than, than the other data. Um, and, and package that all with our, uh, with our, our uh, partners and then we actually produce it in our white papers, and, and we've uh, cleaned up some of our white papers lately. And, and go to the white paper page on the Valencell website, and over the next week or two, you're going to see some, some of these, these exact same graphics here in, in terms of what I put on the screen here is the intensity type of stuff. So that's really the summary of what our lab does as it relates to what we've discovered over the years and our best practices. I'll take a few questions that Ryan's uh, gotten. And um, if you have further information, you can always contact us at this info at valencell.com. Okay, great. Thanks, Chris. Yeah, the first question that came in uh, is related to chest trap. So what is the chest trap baseline you utilize for testing? I assume that's uh, around the specific yep. brand. We, we're, we're using a, we generally use a Polar H7, although we have some Sunto straps as well. And they, there's, there are benefits of different reasons. The, the Sunto strap has internal storage, so it's better for certain use cases. The H7 is good. It's quick, and, and a lot of people use it. We do look for peer-reviewed research that has validated these chest straps before we use them uh, and uh, start to use them in that way. Okay. Uh, next question is around uh, published reports. So it, 
Is there any published reports we can access with a full breakdown of these statistics and analysis that you talked through here? Yeah, they're, they are, and you'll, they'll show up. They're on the Valencia White, um, white, pa uh, white Papers page. Uh, and like I said, the exact examples of some of these graphics, I, we've got some new white papers that are uh, available uh, and going to be published over the next week or two on the Valence Cell site. And all of this, including the methods, will be in these white papers. And that's, um, if you're interested in the specific link, that's just valencecell.com slash white dash papers. Uh, you can just go to valencecell.com and, and hit the link as well uh, to get to those white papers. And um, uh, looks like we've got one other question come in. Uh, for anyone else who's interested, uh, just continue to submit your questions through the, the webinar interface and we'll take them as they come in. Uh, next question is if uh, someone's interested in visiting uh, our facilities and your lab, uh, what's the procedure for that? Yep, uh, we're, we're, we are open to having uh, visitors. You, know, you can contact info at valencecell.com and inquire about that and see uh, what the arrangements need to, to be to, to come here and visit. Uh, of course, we have you know, restrictions on when that can happen and, and that sort of thing, depending on the type of testing that we have. But Raleigh, North Carolina is where we're at. So it's, uh, if you're in the area, we're, we're happy to talk about it. So that looks like all of the questions that have come through at the moment. Um, anyone else on the call with a question, please do submit that through the, the um, webinar interface. Or uh, if you think of questions later after we're done here, uh, feel free to send us an email at info at And uh, we'll get right back to you. Uh, give it a few more, um, give it a little more time um, to uh, to see if any other questions come in, but at the moment I think it um, that may be it. So um, I'll just say uh, thanks everyone for taking time out of your busy schedules to spend an hour with us here today. Hope you found it valuable. Chris, thanks for your time and all of your insights and. Um, uh, as I mentioned, we will be sending around the links to the recording and then also uh, the slides for anyone who may not uh, have been able to make it here today. So thanks again, everyone. Thanks, Chris. And uh, we look forward to seeing everyone next month on uh, the, uh, the next Valence Cell webinar. Thanks, Thank everyone. you all.